The following program is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools. Welcome to Meet the Author. I'm your host, Emily Godfrey. Joining me in the studio today is New York Times bestselling author, Adam Gidwitz. Mel, welcome, Adam. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Also joining us via Skype are students from Ormond Stone Middle School. Hello, everyone. Hi, guys. Hi. Adam's collection of books include the Grimm Book Series, the Unicorn Rescue Society, and his Newbery Honor winner, The Inquisitor's Tale, just to name a few. So Adam, welcome. Thank you. And can you tell us a little bit about the Unicorn Rescue Society? Sure. So uh, it's a series about two kids, um, Elliot and Uchenna, and they travel around the world rescuing mythical creatures from danger. Pretty simple. Um, they have an eccentric mentor whose name is Professor Fauna. He's a... Uh, you know, if you've ever seen Back to the Future, the movie, he's a little bit like Doc Brown, but he's like on caffeine all the time, and he really wants to find a unicorn. It's in fact the one creature he's never found. And they have a little sidekick named Jersey, who's a Jersey devil. He's blue and has wings, and he's adorable and, and creates as much trouble as he solves. It sounds like there's lots of potential for trouble and adventure. There is. I think of it as like a, as in a mystery adventure comedy with mythical creatures. Uh, so if that sort of thing doesn't appeal to you, then who are you and what's wrong with you? I mean, that's, that's <laughs> exactly, I just wrote what I would want to read. So That's awesome. Yeah. Well, our Stone Middle School students read your latest book in the series, The Chupacabra of the Rio Grande, and they have some questions to ask you. Excellent. So who has the first question for Mr. Gidwitz? Hi. Hello. Um, what inspired you to create the Unicorn Rescue Society series featuring mythical creatures? That's a great question. Um, I think mythical creatures are awesome. Now, kids know about some mythical creatures. Everybody knows about unicorns, uh, giants. Uh, some people know about the phoenix, griffin, sasquatch, bigfoot, Loch Ness monster. But there are literally millions of mythical creatures from cultures all over the world. And I thought it was kind of sad that kids only knew about a few of them, or if they knew about a creature like, let's say, the chupacabra, um, they might know weird stories that are, that are not accurate about it, or they may not know the coolest elements of it. So I wanted to create a series that told everyone those stories, told them well, um, and uh, made them laugh along the way. I'm sorry, I have to add one thing. There are a lot of mythical creatures you haven't heard of that are amazing, such as, for example, um, maybe the kids there can raise their hand. Have you ever heard of a Bassan? Raise your hand if you've heard of a Bassan. Okay, nobody. That is a fire-breathing chicken from Japan. Oh, come on. Now that you've heard about it, raise your hand if you think that's awesome. Excellent. See, that's why I had to write the series, so that I can tell you guys about stuff like that. Awesome. We're, we're ready for our next question. In the book, there were people who were protesting. What types of issues do you think are acceptable to protest, and have you ever protested? Oh, uh, podcasting? Protesting. Protested. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I think protesting is important. I think it's a good thing to do. I don't know about you guys. Um, as a young person, you see the world differently than adults do. You have feelings and emotions that are just as real, just as important, and just as true. Your thoughts are just as true as adults, but you don't often have the power to act on those thoughts. So sometimes the way you have to get people to pay attention to the great thoughts and ideas that you have is by protesting. Maybe you make signs. Maybe you walk around outside and distract people. You might even block the way of where everyone's walking, you know, signs, chanting, in order to express your opinions. Kids are ignored too much by adults. And so I think protesting is a really important way for kids uh, to get their viewpoints heard and taken seriously. What a powerful answer. Who has the next question? <laughs> awesome. We read that unicorns really existed. Do you believe that they existed? If so, how do you think unicorns came to be? Whoa, good question. Wait, first of all, did you say, do you believe that they exist or they do not exist? What do you think? 
Do you believe that they exist? No, I'm asking you. <laughs> Me? Yes. <laughs> you think they do? Yeah. Excellent. I agree with you. So here's the thing about unicorns. A lot of people think that they do not exist. Um, but let me tell you uh, something that most people do not know. 150 years ago, Western scientists, scientists in Europe and the United States, thought that gorillas were a myth. They had never found gorillas. They had heard stories of them from West Africa, but never actually found evidence of them. And so they said, gorillas are just a story people tell. It's a mythical creature. And then, of course, they found gorillas, and now we all know the gorillas are very, very real. So scientists have not yet found unicorns, but that does not mean that they do not exist. I, as to how they came to be, you know, that's a question for you know either evolution or God or whatever you believe. I'm not going to talk about where they come from. All I know is we don't know for sure that they're not out there. Let's have our next question. Is it necessary to do research for made-up fantasy stories? Oh, yes. So not only do I try to do research for these stories, um, I actually try to team up with other people who know more than I do about the places, the cultures, the mythologies that we're studying. So for this book, um, uh, Chupacabras of the Rio Grande, I teamed up with an incredible author named David Bowles. David is a Mexican-American guy who lives on, um, in Texas, but right on the border with um, uh, Mexico. He lives in a small town called Donna. I was actually just there this weekend. We, David and I got to hang out. So um, David not only is a wonderful author who's written a bunch of other books, including a book called They Call Me Guero, which just won the Purabel Prey Honor. It's a wonderful book. I really recommend it. Um, he's also a scholar of Mayan and Aztec mythology. So he knows stories about chupacabras, but he also knows those stories about older creatures from thousands of years ago that might be um, have a history of sucking animals' blood, like chupacabras, might look like a hairless dog with yellow feathers on its back, um, kind of like chupacabras. So he was able to bring the culture, the mythology, the history together with my sense of what a Unicorn Rescue Society book should sound like, and we worked together. So it's not just research, it's also collaboration with people who are from that place, um, from that culture, and can really speak to it, not just accurately, but with real authenticity. As a librarian, I love to hear about the research part and how even fan, uh, fictional stories can be based on true facts and you have to gather that yeah. evidence. That's wonderful. We have one more question from Stone Middle School right now. Who is your favorite character to write and does this change for each book in the series? Mm, good question. It does. Um, in fact, it really changes scene by scene because each scene kind of has a, diff has a different star. Like uh, Uchenna, um, she loves music. And she likes to make up songs. And each book, she makes up different songs. And if it's a chapter that's going to have one of Uchenna's songs, I'm always most excited to write Uchenna. Um, for example, in I think the first book, um, she writes a song that goes something like, I'm not going to sing it. I'll just tell you the words. Um, you're welcome. Uh, it goes, um, old ladies are like raisins, not just because they're sweet tasting. They're something, something. And most of all, they're amazing. I missed the middle lines. And Elliot looks at her and goes, old ladies are sweet tasting? And Uchenna goes, yeah, I got to work on that line. Uh, so like, that's really fun to write. Um, Professor Fountain is always acting crazy, so I love writing about him. Um, Elliot is, is always nervous but smart. So depending on who's starring in the scene, um, that's the character that I'm having the most fun writing. Well, those were great questions, Stone. Thank you so much. We'll come back to you a bit later in the show. Do you have a question for Adam Gidwitz? Join the conversation. Give us a call. We welcome your questions and comments. So Adam, after reading the Chupacabras of the Rio Grande, the Stone Middle School students took a school-wide survey asking a very serious question. Mm. What is a Chupacabra? Oh, yes, well, we should. Well, let's find Sorry. out. Yeah. Let's find out what they did. Let's find out what they learned. What is a what? I'm not sure what a chupacabra is. Uh, I've seen it in Scooby-Doo. Do I get any hints? Um... Yeah. Chup chupacabra? Isn't that like a mixture of coyote, wolf, big teeth, something like that? It's some sort of mythical monster of some kind. That kills cats and dogs? I don't know. The animals that like suck blood, like... that 
go to people and like eat people and like suck their blood. Uh, snake. Chupacabra is a legend um, out of Mexico and it is a, about, that's well, a legend. The Hispanic urban legend that, well, I think it was originated in Puerto Rico, Mexico. <laughs> what is a what? A chupacabra. It is. The thing that makes kids scared, I guess. I don't know. A demon creature in Mexico that drinks the blood of sheep and prowls the desert at night. Honestly, I have no idea. The only thing I can think of as a chupacabra would be the pupacabra. Chupacabra is a mythical um, creature believed in a lot of um, Central American countries. Uh, I, the translation in some language is goat sucker. Guess what that chupacabra? <laughs> um. I don't know if it's real or no. Uh, I know that uh, a lot of people in Central America have seen it, but no sé, no sé. An animal of some sort. And what apparently they do is they feed on the livestock in um, these countries and they, they would eat the sheep and the goats and they would suck the blood out of them. Um, it's kind of like a Mexican vampire, but they only eat animals. Other than that, I don't know. I think a chupacabra is a bobtail, it's a made up animal. It's, um, Mexican story. So like a cabra and a, another sort of animal that people say it is sort of like a monster. I have no clue. Um, I really don't know what that is. It is a creature that lives in the desert area near... Um, An evil animal or something? I guess some urban legend. I just know it lives in a desert area. You got me. When I was growing up, I watched a TV series that had an episode about a chupacabra, so I did a ton of research on it because it was kind of scary, actually. I have no idea what a chupacabra is. What is a chupacabra? So inquiring minds want to know, what is a chupacabra? Well, I mean, I thought that they answered that pretty well in, the, uh, uh, in that video. Uh, and I loved seeing the various reactions uh, from that one kid saying, I don't know, like eight times. Why did you keep asking him? He clearly didn't know. Um, <laughs> a chupacabra is a um, small, hairless dog that sucks the blood from animals. Um, as we understand it, in our version of it, and there are many versions of the chupacabras, um, in our version, it only sucks the blood from sleeping animals and it doesn't kill the animals. Um, in the very beginning, some, an animal dies in our book because it's a baby chupacabra who's separated from his family and he hasn't learned how to properly feed yet. So it's a small, hairless dog that sucks, sucks blood from animals and instead of running, it bounces. Um, so it is a bouncing, hairless, blood-sucking dog. Perfect answer. <laughs> Well, their students at Stone also conducted a poll and gathered some, some research to find out how many people in their building actually knew what a chupacabra was. So here we have a graphic. We have some information. Um, so it looks like they polled 20 students and staff. 36% of the staff were close to a fully correct answer. 55% of students knew something about chupacabras. So on average, they had a 45% success rate of correctly identifying a Chupacabra, jumping or not jumping, okay, no, either one. But what a cool way to incorporate literacy and math. Yeah, that, that was really smart. I really liked it. Um, I also, the fact that 45% on average of the people knew what it was um, uh, is one of the reasons why we wrote the series, right? Um, and the closer you get to the border and to Puerto Rico, um, where the legend originated, um, the more and more people know it. And the farther north you go, it tends to be the fewer and fewer people have heard of chupacabras. Well, I believe we have a phone call question for you. Caller, hi, welcome to the show. What is, all right. So we have a phone caller and they're getting ready. Okay. So we will find out what their name and their question is for you. So hi, caller, go ahead with your question. So in the Inquisitor's Tale, mm. what made you think of the characters and make them that way? Great question. That's a fabulous question. So The Inquisitor's Tale, for those who don't know uh, the book, is a medieval adventure. It takes place in the Middle Ages of knights and kings and castles. And it's about three kids, a girl who has visions of the future, a boy with incredible strength, another boy who can heal people's wounds, um, and a holy dog. 
And um, the, the reason I came up with the book is, so um, I lived for a year in Europe. Um, very lucky. My, my wife is a professor of medieval history. And um, so she was doing her research for her scholarly book, and I started um, getting some ideas for this one. I was traveling around, and we went to a monastery, and we walked. Um, there's, uh, the monastery is surrounded by water, and when the tide goes out, um, there are beds of quicksand. And we walked um, through the bay, and actually a guide took us to a bed of quicksand. We got to um, sink our, our feet into the bed of quicksand, which was terrifying. <laughs> um, the guide also told us to get out of the bed of quicksand, which is good. Um, the, uh, uh, and after that experience, I thought, Maybe I should write a book about this. And then we were, um, I walked in an old growth forest that really felt haunted and read a story about a haunted forest where these fiends lived. And I thought, maybe I should write a story about that. Um, then I read a story about um, a holy dog, a dog who had saved a baby um, uh, and then tragically died. And, and I thought, maybe I should write a story about that. Um, my dog comes back to life because I hate it when dogs die in books. I, I was then in a, um, uh, the Jewish Museum in Paris, and I'm Jewish, and uh, my wife is Christian, studies Christian uh, theology, Christian monks. And in the Jewish Museum in Paris, there was a plaque that said, there were no Jewish books in that museum from before 1242 because King Louis of France, King Louis IX, um, also known as Saint Louis, the city of Saint Louis is named after him, had gathered all of the French books, all of the Jewish French books together in 1242 and burned them. And when I read that, I felt the sick feeling in my stomach and I thought, maybe I should write a story about that. And then I read a story um, that was written down in 1268, so 800 years ago, um, and it was from the life of St. Martha. And in that story, St. Martha has to fight a dragon that kills people by farting on them. Yeah, it says, whenever anyone attacks the dragon, it turns and casts behind it its ordure, and whatever it toucheth burneth like fire. And I read that and I was like, okay, I'm writing yeah. the book. So I put all of those things together. So the characters come from all of these different stories and legends uh, through medieval history. Well, I'm glad that you included all of those bits because the story is phenomenal. Thank you so much. And we're gonna go back to our students at Stone. They have some more questions for you. Okay. So hi, Stone. Who has our next question for Mr. Gitwitz? Um, are any of the characters in your books um, about people on people that you know? Yeah, that's uh, a great question. So they are based on real people. For example, um, the main characters of the Unicorn Rescue Society, Elliot and Uchenna, are based on students that I taught when I was a teacher. So um, Uchenna was a girl that I taught in, in first grade, um, and she really was spunky and hilarious and very brave. And Elliot is based on a boy I taught the next year when, when he was in second grade. Um, I changed his name because uh, uh, the boy didn't want me to use his real name in the books. Um, that He did like his character in the books. Um, Uchenna uh, wanted me to use her real name. She was very cool with that. Um, so they are based on, on real, real kids that I knew. And they were you know, first and second grade then. And now they're both out of college, which makes me feel super old. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they are. They're based on real people. All right, what is your next question? Uh, what type of research do you do when you write books? Oh, I love it. So um, it really depends on the book. So like I was telling you, Unicorn Rescue Society, I team up with people from that culture who can tell the stories really well. Um, other books, I do different kinds of research. So for the uh, Inquisitor's Tale, the medieval book I was talking about, um, my wife was sort of my director of research. So what would happen is I would say to her, I want to write a chapter that takes place in a peasant village during a market day. And she would say, great, you need to read this book, this book, this book, and this book before you're allowed to write that chapter. And I'm like, what? So I would have to read all those books and sort of take in the details of them. And then I start writing the chapter um, a, uh, to incorporate those details. So each book is different. For my, my Grimm books, A Tale Dark and Grimm and its Companions, I just read Grimm's fairy tales. I read a lot of them and I practiced telling them. Sometimes research involves practice. So when I read a grim fairy tale, I have one reaction to it. But when I tell it out loud to young people, I have a different one. And the story, all these kinds of old folk tales, evolve over time. The more you tell them, the more they change, the better they get. So I would tell a story many times before I actually wrote it down. You can hear some of my practicing if you want to. Um, I have a podcast called Grim, Grimmer, Grimmest. It's free on iTunes. And you can hear me tell scary, 
uh, kind of gross, grim fairy tales live to kids, which is fun um, because they scream and stuff. It's hilarious. Uh, you'll like it. <laughs> All right, let's hear your next question. Uh, what advice do you have about writing the ending of your book so your read readers will remember it and feel satisfied? Whew. I'm not sure that I can give advice on writing the endings of my books. Endings are very hard. I have to rewrite them over and over and over again before I feel like I've gotten them right. Um, you generally want to try to bring things together. I often think of um, planting a seed in the beginning of, of the book and that by the end of the book, the seed will have um, grown up out of the soil and blossomed in sort of an unexpected way. So I do like to have that happen. Sometimes I like things to go full circle. If you read the Grimm books, um, uh, uh, A Tale Dark and Grimm starts one place, goes very different places, but then surprisingly sort of comes back to where it began. That can be satisfying. The Unicorn Rescue Society, they all end with the words, to be continued. And the reason is when I was a very young person, probably your age, I first saw the movie Back to the Future. And in that movie, at the end of the movie, not to give away too much, the orange letters to be continued um, came across the screen. And I had never seen that happen before and it blew my mind. I was like, that's the coolest <laughs> thing that has ever happened to me in my life. It may still be the coolest thing that's happened to me in my life to this day. My daughter being born is second to that. So, um, so, so, Every ending, again, kind of has to suit the book. Um, but you do want to make a big emotion come up in the reader, and that's, that's what I try to do. What would you do to ruin an ending? Mm. Like, what would be the worst thing you could do wow. ending a book? Well, that's a good question. There are, I would have to say, there are plenty of great books with sad endings, um, and they're very famous. That is never my style. Um, I, you know, I learned a lot about storytelling from fairy tales. My first three books were about fairy tales. And in fairy tales, um, especially the Grimm fairy tales, the Brothers Grimm take kids and they put them through scary things. Scary things happen to them. Dark, bloody, upsetting. But by the end, the kids always succeed in the Grimm fairy tales. Um, and th I like that because um, kids' lives can be tough. Uh, as adults, we often forget that. But um, they uh, you know, aren't allowed to make a lot of their own choices. They have to go to school, whether they want to or not. They have to do their homework, whether they want to or not. Um, adults get to tell them what to do. They have siblings, other kids who can be mean. And yet, almost every kid perseveres through childhood and grows wiser and stronger from childhood and comes out the other end. And I like my books to show that kind of journey. Um, so that's the kind of ending that I like to write. Well, thank you, and thank you, Stone Middle School. Those were great questions. Um, if time permits, we'll come back to you for more in a little bit. But right now, I believe we have another phone call question okay. for you. So, caller, what is your name and what is your question? Hello, my name is I. My question is, what inspired you to be an author that writes fantasy for a living? <sighs> great question. What inspired me to be an author that writes fantasy for a living? So, um... I think it all started in the seventh grade. Uh, get comfortable, kids. <laughs> We're going back. Um, I was, uh, I was, I remember sitting in seventh grade and I had an author come to my school and speak to me. Um, and I have to admit, I don't remember the name of the author. Um, I don't remember any books the author wrote. In fact, I don't remember anything the author said. Nothing, except for one thing. Somebody asked the author, how do you know if you are a writer? My ears perked up, I was curious. Uh, I didn't think I would be a writer when I grew up. I was pretty sure I'd be a professional basketball player. Did not work out, I don't know why. Um, but the other thought about it for a minute, she says, how do you know if you're a writer? And then she says, writers write. And I was like, uh, obviously. And? Yeah. <laughs> but then I thought about it, okay, maybe she got a point, writers write. Well, do I write while I write for school when I remember to do my homework? And, but do I write on my own for fun? Because I figured that's what she meant. The answer was, no, I never did. And so I decided on that day in seventh grade that I was not a writer and that I never would be. And I was sure of it. Um, and every time I get an idea for a story after that, because everybody gets a data sometimes, right? You're like working on the street and you see an old lady and you're like, wouldn't it be cool if that old lady turned humongous and attacked a city or something? The answer is yes, that would be awesome. Yes. Um, but I would always write like a paragraph or two and I'd always quit and be like, Psh, who am I kidding? I know I'm not a writer. Um, but I'm here today and got all my books around you, so how'd that happen? I think this is how. 
Um, when I was a kid, we used to have these uh, toys called G.I. Joes. Um, you may not have heard of them, kids, but they were like little action figures with like masks and, you know, like Barbies. They're like, they're like mini Barbies with weapons, okay? So I used to play with these G.I. Joes all the time, and it would always go the same way. I would take one in each hand, and one was usually the cool kid from school, and the other one was me, <clears throat> not the coolest kid. And uh, he would say something mean and funny to me, and all the other G.I. Joes would laugh. And then I would say something awesome and hilarious back to him, and then I would feel really good about myself. Or it's not always easy to think of a good comeback to the cool kids, so say, he would say something mean and funny, and I would just beat him up, like, bah, 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 which was equally satisfying. <laughs> so I used to do this for like hours a day. The other thing I used to like to do as a kid was I had a basketball hoop on my driveway. And I used to, um, uh, what I would do is I'd put it down as low as it could go, and I would dunk and shoot three pointers and take fadeaways. And the whole time I would talk to myself and tell myself these stories about me making the NBA. And um, years later, I uh, became a teacher in New York City, and um, I started telling stories to kids, and eventually I started to write them down. And one day I was sitting at home telling a story out loud to my kids, and I suddenly realized telling a story out loud and going like this, typing it, is just about exactly the same thing as telling a story out loud and going like this with G.I. Joes, or telling a story out loud and going like this on a six-foot basketball hoop. And I suddenly realized I had been a writer my whole life. Every day of my life I'd spent two or three hours a day writing. I never wrote any of those stories down then, uh, but now I do, um, and I get paid to do it. So I think uh, I became a writer. In fact, I was always a writer. Um, I just didn't know it back then. That is wonderful, and I'm sure a lot of kids can relate to that as well. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you make stuff up, if you play, if you stare out the window during math class making up a story. You're creating. That's being a writer. You can write it down now, you can write it down later, it's the same thing. So next time your math teacher is like, hey, pay attention, what are you doing? You say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm preparing to be a writer. It'll work, I promise. <laughs> Wonderful. So we have uh, time for one more question from our middle school students at Stone. So let's go back to them right now. Hi, Stone, what's your question? Do you have any advice for aspiring writers? Awesome. I sure do. So the most important thing that you can do as a young person, if you're interested in being a writer, is to have as much fun as you can while you write. Don't worry about making it perfect. Don't worry about spelling or grammar. Don't even really worry anything about finishing your stories if you don't feel like finishing your story. You don't right now need to pay the rent with your writing. Maybe one day you will. But until that time, the more you can do to have fun, the more you can do to be creative, um, even, even not writing, playing, imagining, talking to yourself, those are preparations for writing so that what you're doing, you know, if you want big muscles, you do push-ups. If you want a big creative brain, you imagine. Imagination is like push-ups for your brain. So the more imagining you're doing and the more fun you're having while you're writing, the more creative you will become um, and the better you'll become at creating engaging, uh, funny, uh, creative stories. So. Have fun and imagine. And you can lay off the video games and the screens a little bit in favor of your own imagination because, again, that will help. Video games are like sitting on the couch. Uh, imagining is like doing push-ups. So a few more push-ups. Yeah, you got to have some time being bored to develop those great stories in your mind and, you and to practice with your imagination. That's true. I know I've just become very unpopular with all of you, and I apologize. <laughs> Well, thank you, Stone Middle School, for joining us today. Those were wonderful questions. Thank you so much. So, Adam, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank it's you. Been it's been wonderful so chatting with you. It's been a real pleasure. I have had a great time. I really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me, and thanks for those great questions. Those were fabulous. Well, if you would like to learn more about Adam Gidwitz, visit his website. To learn more about our upcoming programs, visit the Fairfax Network. For the Fairfax Network, I'm Emily Godfrey. Keep reading, keep writing, and keep dreaming. Thanks for watching.